Hi, I'm Paul Jay. Welcome to the Analysis God News. A perfect storm is brewing. We'll be back in just a few seconds with Thomas Ferguson to talk about it. Please don't forget, as you're considering your year-end donations, uh, the analysis.news is a 501c3 in the United States. So if you want to donate and avoid some taxes, uh, you could do so. Uh, you, you also subscribing if you're on YouTube and most importantly, get on our email list and share it with as many people as you can. And we'll be back in just a few seconds. A perfect storm is gathering for the Democratic Party in the 2022 midterms and perhaps 2024 in the presidential election. In an analysis of the 2020 election titled 2020 Knife Edge Election, an analysis by Thomas Ferguson, Paul Jorgensen, and Ji Chen, it concludes with the following. If the Biden administration fails, what then? At the opening of this essay, we saw how most of big business, even parts of it otherwise friendly to Trump's policies, were not prepared to tolerate the disjointed efforts by the president, a minority of his supporters, to overthrow the election results. But it is already obvious that the resonant promises by many businesses to cut off supporters of the January 6 putsch attempt from future political funding are hollow. It goes on, food and energy price rises are running very high while wages are not keeping pace, especially if the administration cannot get a better grip on COVID, which heavily impacts daycare, schools, and older workers near retirement, and thus labor supply. Then serious deterioration in living standards of many Americans becomes a real possibility. Recent statistical studies suggesting that, quote, deaths of despair, end quote, and related pathologies largely mirrored dismal exiting patterns rather than increasing should be a red flag given the lapse of pandemic support programs. One must wonder what could happen in the event of another economic downturn or a resurgence of movements for social justice and the defense of living standards squeezed by food and energy price inflation, putsch attempts that started out looking like Opera Buffet, uh, that's a comic opera in Paris, have sometimes led to much worse, end quote. And that means not so comic. Thomas Ferguson is about to join us. He's a professor emeritus at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. He's director of research at the Institute for New Economic Thinking and a senior fellow at Better Markets. Thanks very much for joining us, Tom. Well, Thanks for having me, Paul. You know, there's so many alternatives these days to not showing up. I can say with unusual passion that I'm very glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, we're happy you are. Uh, so uh, essentially, uh, you have done a, a really deep analysis of what happened in 2020. And there's we're going to do four segments uh, in this interview. Uh, in part one, we're going to deal with the perfect storm brewing for 2022. Uh, part two, we're going to look at just what the paralysis uh, of the Democratic Party is and what they're trying to do and, and what that paralysis could lead to. Uh, part three, we're going to look at something very unique in this paper. It's just the analysis of Trump's agricultural policies and that how that helped him in the 2020 election and might do so again. And part four, we're going to look at the forces against effective climate change policy, fossil fuel industry, sections of private equity in Wall Street. But first of all, the perfect storm. So, Tom, what, what do you learn from the 2020 election that makes you think such a storm is, is brewing? Well, all right. First of all, uh, I think it, people have argued up and down about this, but our paper, I think, shows pretty uh, convincingly that Trump was probably a winner in, in early 2020, even despite all the negatives he had for all kinds of reasons. Um, and 
COVID cost of the election, uh, along with the, in the end, the net result of all the mass demonstrations, and I think we're the only people that have looked at this as our impact on county level voting uh, there. Um, a combination of social protest and COVID cost them the election. And, you know, but the social protest is obviously growing in no small part out of the inability to deal with COVID. Um, and frankly, uh, you know, we, after uh, a year of Joe Biden, almost a year, they haven't dealt too effectively with COVID either. And now they have what Trump didn't have, a real inflation problem. And so you put those two together and yeah, that's uh, the perfect storm. I hate, you know, I, I hate to use cliches. I could imagine things even getting worse. No trouble. I usually can't, you know, if you want it, my, my usual slogan that I use at the end of interviews is, uh, you know, you want a happy ending, see a Disney movie, but you know, here, you know, all right, we're going into the interview. Uh, I'm not. All right, let's, okay. Let, let's break down some, what you just said. So let's start with the issue of social protest. One of the conclusions you reach in your study, which is a little bit counterintuitive from what the media has been saying, is that overall the Black Lives Matter protest actually helped the Democrats, where a lot of people are saying, for example, the slogan defund the police uh, actually helped defeat some Democrats. So break that down. OK, um, I, I begin, though, by noting that, you know, as you said, it wasn't just me, Paul Jorgensen and Ji Chen. We did it together. Um, but uh, what let me explain first what we did, which is we actually look at county voting uh, returns. I mean, so it's an aerial study, meaning, you know, we're looking at re re weeks. And so we can do things that you can't do in national polls. Um, I mean, you can take a national poll and you get, you know, it's as though the whole country were a point or something. Um, and so what we did is to look at play, we actually looked at, used basically other people's data sets on uh, riots, that Princeton data set on um, social turmoil, and also Mike Elk at Payday's uh, labor um, wildcat strike data. We looked we look at those and put those into a broader study of what's driving the election. And along with COVID, you can see that the net result of all the demonstrations, I would be a little cautious about identifying everything with Black Lives Matter. There's like 20,000 or more uh, protests of various sorts in some of those data sets. Um, and the labor stuff is not caught in any of that. That's what, uh, But we, we, we do it. Um, and uh the net effect of that was it's for sure it seems to help biden a bit uh there now does that mean that everything individually is popular uh i rather doubt that you know defund the police is a winning slogan although when you unpack defund the police what you find is it's mostly a collection of recommendations that have been almost standard in criminology and uh similar disciplines since the 1990s. I mean, in that respect, most of it's not particularly strike, but I think the slogan is probably a vote loser. And yeah, I, th I also think the immigration question that is sometimes posed as simply, I mean, there are folks who have suggested that some of those movements were for just open borders. I don't think that's generally the case, but that's surely a vote loser too. But the protest movement did I think did not uh, cost Trump? I'm sorry, did not cost the Democrats votes. Well, contrary, it gave them a slight, slight net plus. I think. Um, so. Okay, so the but the big headline here is that Trump, because of his strength in the swing states, uh, was on his way to victory and so mishandled the COVID situation. Uh, so why did he so mishandle the the COVID situation? All right, there we spend a lot of time on, uh, I think we, it's fair to say we put a lot of effort into that because the media reporting on this stuff has not been very good. The question is how come the CDC, the Trump administration, uh, any number of private hospitals and chains and so forth, and not just in the United States, elsewhere, what was the problem with getting effective responses? Because the U.S. basically did very little under Trump. And the usual view has been uh, it's all Trump's fault. 
uh, at that point. You know, the Biden administration has not really grasped the nettle here. They're bringing out, even as we speak, a new program uh, designed to deal with Omicron, but uh, they just haven't done it. I mean, our, we spend a good deal of time documenting the, the business pressures around the world because there's a considerable look. The interaction in the critic in the early period of the Trump administration, the interaction with the UK uh, is very strong, and the statistical and epidemiological studies go back and forth. I mean, I know I've seen this myself in, in various meetings. Um, and so uh, you want to pay attention to the international context. But there was just everywhere from the moment this started, governments like in Italy or in Austria, they just wouldn't close down. And I mean, the Tyrol, the Tyrol very famously became a place where uh, super spreadings uh, went out from skiers to the whole of Europe uh, in like January and February of uh, 2020. Um, and in the UK, well, Boris Johnson made a mess of things and the Trump people were following. But there was a tremendous amount of direct business pressure and we document it from, especially from Trump's kitchen cabinet. It is striking to me how many books uh, on the election just drop out. I am I, I think I'm right that the, the private equity folks in that kitchen cabinet, not to mention the whole kitchen cabinet, barely figure in the Washington Post book, which is otherwise pretty good on some aspects of the 2020 election. It does figure in the New York Times coverage. Uh, I have to give credit for that. Um, but uh, there's been basically a continuous obligato running that basically says, let's try to disrupt as little as possible normal business. Now, what that leads to, I mean, uh, I wrote a paper with Philip Alvelda and uh, John Mallory uh, in which we sort of showed the obvious that uh, if you neglect, if you let COVID get going, uh, then the breakdowns get bigger. Uh, all you do is you postpone the inevitable and you get smashed. Now, uh, the U.S. never it's, and still does not have, uh, you know, now two years into this and with a year under Biden, they don't really have big, large scale mass testing on a random basis. So they can't actually track variants. Even today, stories are appearing about how the U.S. is sitting around trying to use foreign data, the C our CDC, for example, to try to figure out, you know, what's with Omicron. This is crazy. They should have done that. They should have done it quickly when they came in. They've been putting out stories in recent weeks saying they've done it. They haven't done it to the level they, that they should. Um, but the mass testing business, they just neglected. Nobody tried to push rapid, cheap tests, in. I think, in any serious way. And the, 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 the scale of the efforts, especially where this has been catastrophic, is, is, you know, there are uh, lots of, well, not lots, but there are some excellent cheap large scale tests that you can do that are quite inexpensive. Schools and those haven't been using them mostly, the public schools. They're stuck with their legacy certified providers. And so they're paying way more than they should for tests. The, the failures on school policy uh, in Biden, in both Trump and Biden, have been really grotesque. I mean, um, again, uh, Philip Alvelda and I and uh, D.P. Guignani, who was a primary researcher in the second wave of British studies, wrote a paper on this, you know, which we, these are all published out of INET, by the way, the Institute for New Economic Thinking. They're easily available on the web. We, we took a, um, a critical eye at the proposals to go back the Biden administration wanted to do it on March 15th. Um, that was obviously nuts. And for about three weeks, uh, Randy Weingartner, uh, actually at the American Federation of Teachers, uh, just actually said, read the paper, took it seriously and said, you know, we ought to rethink this. Then she did a 180 about a month later uh, on that. And in practice, you can see what they, they did is they slow walked the, the business of going back into education. But the people have not pushed on the big key question of ventilation in school. We know that more than about half of American schools, public schools, have you know, very old ventilation systems or nothing at all. I mean, that is to say, you open a window, which is fine until it gets to be January uh, in, uh, you know, Boston or someplace. Um, and 
The ventilation problem has not been addressed. They should have insisted on, if they were going to go back to everybody going back on airplanes, they should for sure have mandated testing to get on domestic flights as well as the international flights. Um, and, and they haven't. Uh, and they're, I, according to press reports, they're not doing it today either. That's a big mistake. Um, and most of all, though, what Trump uh, you know, put a lot of effort into uh, vaccine development with a federally subsidized one way or the other, sometimes direct cash, sometimes giving them a guarantee to buy uh, on vaccines. Their other efforts were less successful. They were also trying to do various you know, lower level remedies than vaccines. Um, but the Biden administration basically put all, has put all of its money on vaccines. I mean, they would just, just get vaccinated and everything will solve. Well, it won't solve itself. And they're finding that out. You've got to have a multi-layered uh, defense. Yeah, people need to get vaccinated. Uh, but like even the, under Biden, the CDC was very slow to take the point um, of the Israeli studies on the need for um, revaccination as the uh, efficiency of the vaccine ebbs. Uh, and they should have picked up on that much faster. Now they're rushing, the Biden people are now trying to rush that one through. But, you know, your net effective vaccination rates, if I may use that term, are not what the published rates of vaccination suggest because it deteriorates with time. Uh, and, of course, uh, the giant policy failure. I mean, you're among the many people who've called attention to this poll. So I'll, you know. Well, why not we'll give credit where credit's due? Um, they have not pushed nearly hard enough and fast enough to vaccinate the rest of the world. I, I, I don't believe that you know a, a normal government program would have given you the vaccination uh, efforts that they got, even though those rest heavily on things like the big DARPA grant that helped uh, create the mRNA um, vaccines. Um, and um, other federal support, National Institute of Health and so forth, for a long time. Um, in that respect, okay, so you need private companies, but the patent rights these folks have negotiated for and their ability, which are still not, when many of their deals with most countries are still secret uh, as to what they, they, they shouldn't be allowed to bluntly extort the rest of the world the way they appear to be trying to do. And the government, has, Biden's administration has clearly started leaking reports on some of them now and trying to pressure them indirectly. These guys need to be told that no, you can't hold the rest of the world hostage. And this policy, it's a little bit like the London sewer systems in the late 19th century that made even rich Londoners sick sometimes. Uh, you know, if you don't do anything about the rest of the world, they'll generate over time, even if you can, you know, reduce it in your country, which we have done only in part. They are uh, the rest of the world that's unvaccinated will keep generating variants. And some of these are really dangerous. We're all arguing about Omicron as we uh, sit here. But it's like they should push much harder on that. that that's a policy failure. And they're not they're not doing nearly enough. All right. So so part one or point one of the perfect storm for 2022 is COVID ain't over and it ha it sunk Trump and it could, uh, it could contribute to sinking the Democrats in 2022 because of all the economic disruption and, and suffering that's going to be the result of the continuation of COVID in one variant or the other. Okay. Let's continue this discussion in a part two of this interview. Uh, but I, I want to somewhat correct something I said, at the beginning of the interview, I, call, I said there's a perfect storm brewing for the Democrats. Well, if if the Republicans are able to take control of the House and perhaps the Senate, that's a perfect storm for humanity. That means climate deniers have now taken control of American legislative power. And there's not going to, in the last two years of Biden's presidency, there won't be anything seriously done on climate. And who knows what the hell happens in 2024. So this is really a perfect storm for humanity. So we're going to talk about the politics of climate in part two. Well, well, and one yeah. friendly amendment to that. The other thing you've got to realize here is the climate change is hugely bound up 
with, in practice, redistributional changes that work mostly against ordinary people. I mean, you can't okay. Well, let's let's do let's do that in the next segment. Okay. okay. So so join us for part two. We're going to focus on uh, 2022, the the politics of climate, and also Tom's done some important research on the breakdown where fossil fuel and private equity money went. Uh, right up to the last second in the 2020 election and where it's going to go again. An active block fighting against effective climate change policy. So please join us for that. Uh, thanks, Tom. And we'll be back uh, with part two in just a few days.